first up, we have a perspective from Northern Ireland uh, being presented by our own Siobhan Fitzpatrick here, who is the CEO of Early Years, who is going to be telling us about the Media Initiative for Children. Thank you, Thank Siobhan. You, Laura. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to my colleagues here in, in Belfast and in Northern Ireland. A big welcome to my colleagues from the International Network and the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. And a big thank you to Queen's for organising the event and indeed supporting our work over the past number of years. A particular welcome to Rima. And I'm sure any of you who heard her this morning know that with the commitment and leadership that Rima has, we will definitely get that UN resolution on early childhood development and peace building. So it's, it's, I think we're honoured to have you leading the work. It's my privilege um, to tell you about the journey that we have been on in Northern Ireland in terms of developing an early childhood uh, programme aimed at building a more inclusive, peaceful society. I want to tell you a little bit about my organisation because that's important. The context in terms of our work, I think, is very important. Our organisation, formerly known as NIPA, was established in 1965, uh, just three short years before the outbreak of what we euphemistically call our troubles. So it is no wonder that the organisation has been deeply influenced by that backdrop. And right from the very beginning, there was a commitment from the organisation that we would attempt to establish cross-community and community development approaches to early childhood care and development. Have was asking yesterday when Paul presented the figure that 93% of children are formally educated in segregated environments, how interesting it is that the early childhood community is indeed integrated in the main. And um, Jim referenced the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and I remember the excitement here in 1989 when we and others uh, we're delighted that the UK signed up and we as an organisation made sure that in everything that we do, the rights and the voice and the visibility of young children are to the fore. Um, we currently support 1,200 early childhood services here in Northern Ireland, but many of you will know that we also work across the border and support services in the Republic of Ireland. Directly employ now 250 staff within the sector and have a reach across the sector to over 10,000 staff. In 1994, as we began the process to peace building, we were delighted but not surprised that the European Union recognised the importance of in building the peace and investing in young children. And since 1994, the European Union has invested over 60 million in supporting, I think as Rima and Jim said, growing peaceful communities from the bottom up from very young children. I'm delighted that our co-founder, Cindy from Colombia, um, is here this morning. We formed in 2003 the International Network on Early Childhood with and peace building. And then, as Rima has already said, grew together to form the Early Childhood Consortia in 2013. I want to share some images. Paul shared some of these yesterday, and I think it begins to describe some of the results that we saw in Paul's report. Some of these murals are still there, young children going to school, on both sides of the community see these murals. We also talked yesterday about the real and invisible peace walls. The Berlin Wall was up for 28 years, the West Bank barrier for 17, but our big wall, the million brick wall in Cooper Street, has been there for 48 years, and it's still there. And as I was reflecting yesterday, you know, since the peace process began, 
we've actually had more barriers than fewer in our society. And in rural areas, we might not have a physical barrier, but there is an invisible barrier where people carry out their lives in separate and segregated ways. In terms of the impact of life and the shadow of the peace walls, nearly 70% of the trouble-related murders took place less than 500 yards from the interface barriers. And almost 85% of the killings occurred within 100 yards, 1,000 yards of those uh, barriers. And living in those areas has significant effect, as we heard from Jim this morning, in terms of the impact on life chances, economic development. There's a higher percentage of mental health problems for those living in closest proximity to the walls. And there's a very high correlation between the peace walls and local communities' ability to access services. This is the million brick wall, and indeed you can see that it hasn't got lower, even though the executive's commitment is to remove all barriers by 2023. We have still a lot of work to do. So I suppose in 2003, when Paul and Alan Smith and Kate Kelly produced what for us was a seminal piece of research too young to notice. It was very concerning and a challenge for us in the early childhood sector who thought we were doing all of the right things, providing high quality early year services, bringing communities together, creating spaces for parents and families across the community divide. But this data, and we knew it anecdotally, this data was a real call for the sector and showed us that, you know, as young as three, while children were developing very positive and important identities about themselves, they were also beginning to develop negative and prejudicial attitudes about others. And that got worse as they got older. So for us in the organisation, it really was a moment when we said, we have to do something different. And, you know, to quote Mandela, no child is born hating another person because of the colour of his skin. Children must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. Because for love, and as Jim told us about oxytocin, love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. And another important quote for us, wouldn't it be wonderful in this world of increasing war, if we could really ask that question, I dream of giving birth to a child who will ask, mother, what was war? So way back in 2003, and in an attempt not to further exacerbate the situation, to do no harm, not to increase prejudice, we developed a new programme called the Media Initiative Respecting Difference programme. And we engaged with Paul and had the support of a wonderful advisory group, people from the Peace Initiative in the States, from local media, from academia, from community relations, helping us think through what a programme would look like. And we involved Paul to do a, a quasi-experimental design um, on just a number of 10 preschool settings, looking at the effect of the programme. And the results were very promising. And it was a very short uh, piece of research, but it did show us that working in this way had the promising capacity to begin to affect positive change. And I was laughing yesterday when people were going through the log frame. I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but this back then was our log frame. And there were many iterations of how we would achieve the outcomes and what were the key immediate and uh, long term uh, activities and actions and what would be our investments. 
But somebody also asked yesterday about how can you turn that log frame into something that's circular and cyclical. And we developed this, as we call it, our organisational model, where children and services are at the centre, exposing those services to robust and rigorous evaluation and research, using that research to communicate effectively within our network of practitioners, communities and families, but also, very importantly, to communicate with our policy um, and politicians with the aim, hopefully, of translating policy based on sound evidence and, in turn, then improving outcomes for children and families. So the Respecting Difference Programme, the Respecting Difference Programme has a number of key elements. As Jim mentioned, we decided to use the media and we developed six 60-second messages. Um, I'll speak a little bit about those in a minute. We also had to develop a new Respecting Difference curriculum, which has now become a full-service design manual. And we had to do that because the Northern Ireland curriculum at the time said nothing about our context. It was wonderful about equal opportunities across the world, but nothing about what was happening here. We also had to develop resources because, again, many great international um, early childhood equipment companies supplying the sector with images from children from India, from the States, but nothing about our context. We also had to develop a new training programme because the early childhood initial and ongoing professional development did very little about preparing teachers to work in a divided society. And we had to support the sector implement by providing really robust support from our early year specialist staff and train them to support the sector. We also had to develop, and knew this right from the beginning, an advocacy and community mobilisation project. The media we used to create a sense of awareness in the broad community, ownership in communities in preschool settings, and indeed in those early days, safety, because we were working with communities in very difficult environments and asking them to implement a very explicit programme about difference from a Northern Ireland perspective. It was very important that the programmes ran regularly over the course of a year, for three weeks at a time, three times a year on national television, both here and in the Republic of Ireland. The resources, you know, again in Northern Ireland, and some of our international visitors find this hard to understand, but quite a lot of things divide us, sport, culture, music. So the resources we developed help children understand and celebrate their own cultural identity, but also know about and understand and respect the others. Um, and also offered opportunities for children to open up conversations about difference in a developmentally appropriate manner. The training for the teachers and parents was critical, and a critical part of that training was not just content-based in terms of delivering the programme. It was allowing teachers and parents reflect on their experience of difference and growing up in a divided society. And often, that was the first time that teachers had that opportunity. They certainly didn't have it in their early childhood development training or their teacher training programmes. We also um, felt it was critically important that we supported parents engage in the programme, both in the early childhood community, but also in their home environments. So parents had the opportunity over a year to experience three parental workshops where they examined um, their own attitudes to difference 
and were provided with resources and strategies to implement the programme in um, the home environment. And indeed, parents and grandparents were critical in terms of engaging with um, at this stage of development. As we know here, many grandparents look after young children and sometimes they were the transmitters of their own experience of the past. The workshops for parents um, focus on reflecting on their own memories of difference, but then also supporting children around a range, not just the sectarian issue, but a range of differences, physical discrimination, racism, sectarianism, bullying and ethnicity. And as we know here in Northern Ireland, the issue of traveller families and the discrimination against those families is another important issue for us. The model, we believe, is not just a classroom model. It wouldn't be effective if it was just delivered in the classroom. We consider it as a community development approach with a focus <coughs> on social justice, participation, allowing communities, communities of early childhood practitioners to have you know, a, a part to play in creating sustainable communities and peaceful communities. And we see it as a community change model. We have used the old Bronfen Brenner child's rights ecology model, and we talked about that yesterday. Seeing the child and the interactions with the child, yes, as critically nested within the relationships of family and community, but also the role of the early childhood practitioner to advocate and mobilise in terms of policy change. And we also did a lot of thinking over the years in terms of how that model fitted or didn't fit with the old traditional uh, model of conflict, you know, the one that you know, we were in a pre-escalation stage, height of conflict, de-escalation and peace. As has been said this morning, that model is redundant. And it's important that whatever we're doing in, in programming, we think of that cyclical nature, unfortunately, of, of conflict. As I said earlier on, in-classroom work alone um, would not work. Um, training teachers on, alone, involving parents and communities, would not work if we really want to influence seismic policy uh, change here. And you know, this influencing, engaging with, having clear messages with our local politicians has been a critical part of the process. As somebody said this morning, we've had a busy year of it, we've had two elections, we haven't really had to change our message because they didn't really get back to business uh, to deliver. But you know, this constant messaging to our local politicians has been vitally important for us. And in terms of messaging, I think you, the use of research, having the evidence, and Rima alluded to that this morning, having the evidence has been critically important to us with the support from Atlantic, and I'm delighted to see Paul Murray in the audience, we were able, you know, and without that support, we would never have been able to do this, have a large random control trial on the program in 2010. And that was coupled with a qualitative, a number of qualitative case studies. Largest trial, and I didn't know that until Paul said it yesterday, largest trial in the world and we were very excited about the results and the potential for ongoing development. And what it told us about you know, this programme's ability to grow very strong, competent, emotionally regulated uh, children. And also promising <coughs> results in terms of parents and their ability and willingness to implement the programme and teachers' confidence about implementing you know, an intentional programme about difference in the early childhood uh, classroom. 
The qualitative case studies told us why some things work, what was critical. And one of the things that was critical for us was that external critical friend, the role that the early year specialist played in helping communities, both individually and in clusters, implement the programme with fidelity. We're, as I said, we're on a journey. The programme is rolling out and going to scale and being implemented with fidelity. And that's a whole other story, because sometimes people think, you know, you've got it when you've got the research evidence. Actually, that's only the beginning of the other journey in terms of if we want to get what we got in the RCT, we have to continue doing what we did. We can't pick and choose a la carte in terms of elements of the programme. So we have developed a very systematic approach to supporting implementation, and that's really hard work. People move out of services, you have to retrain them. A new management board comes you know, along, you have to help them rethink why they're doing this, and parents are constantly changing. And then as well as that, we had to take the learning from the research. You know, the, the research su suggested that there was another opportunity with younger children and an opportunity to extend the programme up the school system. And that's what we've been busy doing over the past couple of years. And now I have a service design manual that covers that spectrum from the age of two in Sure Starts nearly to the end of primary school. And that evidence has also helped us on our, in our advocacy work in terms of education policy. And we were delighted with the success in terms of the new Shared Education Act and indeed an investment in us to do a programme of work across the preschool sector starting now and going on to 2022. <coughs> but there are ongoing developments, some of which you've heard this morning. The International Network on Peace Building have been busy over the last three years. And building on the lessons from the book that was published and edited by Paul and Jackie Hayden from Conflict to Peace Building, we developed taking some of the lessons from the Media Initiative an international programmatic toolkit. And I think Liliana Vasic from Serbia will share how that has been implemented in the Balkans. Taking on board some of the messages as well about the need for ongoing capacity building. And we had this discussion yesterday. The peace building world doesn't know an awful lot about ECD and vice versa. So in partnership with the um, Institute for Conflict Resolution in Ulster, um, we developed a joint master's programme on ECD and peace building. Been running for five years, and Jill McGuinness was here yesterday, one of the first master's people who's now on the doctoral programme. I think she's here today, yeah. <laughs> uh, doctoral programme, Queen's. And that's, you know, our aim was to build very competent practitioners who could be multipliers for this work. We're looking at developing partnerships in Sindhi with our colleagues in the Balkans, with our colleagues in Israel and Palestine, and thinking about the adaptability of this type of work in different contexts. And we were honoured, really honoured then, to be linked and um, merged with the Early Childhood uh, Consortia especially around this advocacy role in terms of having the UN, UN resolution on peace building and early childhood. And then the next great development is the formation of the research network that Paul will talk about later on. It hasn't been an easy and seamless and, you know, easy journey for us at all, but some of the lessons that we've had along the way was, you know, it really is important to make the connection and to do that rigorously between what we're doing in early interventions and the link with peace building and the importance of research in that. It was also important for us to be able to cost the programme and in doing that and show, you know, the really sort of cost benefit of what we were doing 
and the cost of division and conflict, and how that enabled us to further leverage interest and funding. Research and an RCT is important, but we also have to recognise that we're living and working in a very complex world and things don't ha happen in a linear manner. And that ecological approach and the qualitative aspects of what we have been doing have also been important. We, our organisation, we've been on a massive journey of institutional change and development. A focus on delivering outcomes for children does not come easy. It means transformative change. Implementation is also not easy, but with the support from implementation science, I think we have a wonderful framework in which to develop. I think we have found that the model has usefulness elsewhere, and we're happy to share the model with our colleagues in other areas, but recognise that the Media Initiative Northern Ireland will not just be transported and delivered in the Balkans, in Tajikistan, that we have to make those models culturally and contextually appropriate to our own environments and our own conflict situations. Anybody who knows us knows that we still have an awful lot more to do in Northern Ireland. It's, you know, we're 20 years on from the signing of the Peace Accord, but as John Paul Lederach said, you know, for one year of conflict, you really do need 10 years of peace building. And I think we're evidence of that. But we continue, as Seamus Heaney on his headstone says, to walk on air against our better judgment. And I also thought it was appropriate, um, Ali last night, Ali Shah from the Palestine, reminded me when we first met at a conference in, Al in Athens in 2001. And it was a very difficult time for the region, for Palestine and Israel, and indeed for the other speakers on the podium. And we were coming from Northern Ireland, buoyed up by the Good Friday Agreement and the excitement that was about. And being in, being in Greece, you know, and, and many of you from Northern Ireland will know this poem and know these lines very well, and maybe some of the gloss seems to have gone off it a little bit. But I ended my presentation with the, the um, lines from the Cure of Troy. History says, don't hope on the far side of the grave. And that, I think, especially for Ali in the Palestine and, and in Israel, he has always, you know, constantly gone back to that. You know, we have to get to the far side of revenge. And I think, you know, the work that we are doing here hopefully will help in so many ways, in so many different regions, uh, to take that monumental step. And as Rima said, the women of the world always say, do not give up. We always have hope and we will always think about how we can make the best. Yeah. Exactly. We were talking about her last night. Mary Rob the two Marys, Mary Robinson and Mary McAleese, I think have been fantastic role models coming from Ireland uh, for us. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And if anybody wants to find out any more about this work, don't hesitate to contact me or anyone in the organisation. Thank you.